Just following on from Amanda, you know, there is a huge amount of work to do and we've had the, um, the hepatitis C cure here for six years. And I guess every day in my work, I'm constantly amazed at how, how people have not come to be treated yet. And there's no end of education sessions and online training and people visiting GP practices. And every time I sit down, I say, just out of interest, before we treat you today, you know, before we go on today, you know, what are the reasons why you haven't had your hep C treated yet? Where there's just an enormous amount of resources going into this. And the common answer is, I just didn't know about it. That's the number one answer. And I get that a lot in regional Victoria. So people who are just living their life often moved away from um, past lives, for example, and don't associate in that, that group anymore where they know what some of these new movements are. And the other one is I spoke to my GP and they just didn't know what to do about it. And so we just left it there. And, you know, it is one of those things you, you can see from my bio that I, I am a, I love bloodborne viruses and I love talking about them and I talk about them all the time. So I feel very comfortable talking about things like that, but not everybody does. And the stigma associated with hepatitis C is so enormous that people just do not want to bring it up with their GP. And I think that's where the, the main issue is. Um, my job as an outreach nurse is to really be an advocate for our clients and to make that journey a lot easier for them. And we're talking about two types of hepatitis here, the B and the C. Um, the hepatitis, hepatitis C is a, the main, the main problem is there's multiple steps to get treated. It's, it's you have to have a phone and a address with a postal where mail can come for appointments and a GP where you'll attend a bulk billing GP that you can pay for. And then you've got to tell that GP and they've got to know what blood tests to do. And then often the blood tests are done incorrectly or the proper tubes not taken, get the results. And then the GP is not so sure about how to treat it. So they send them to liver clinic and that's another barrier to attend. So often we sort of, in my mind, I think there's often nine steps to getting those tablets. So once you've got the tablets in your hand, it's um, also a little bit tricky because you have to take them for 12, eight to 12 weeks. And I think we all know that taking a course of antibiotics for tonsillitis or a urine infection is hard in, in the majority of people, let alone taking um, tablets for 12 weeks um, or eight weeks and picking up the script, remembering to pick up the next, the next script as well. So with hepatitis C, there's just so many barriers and my job is just to advocate for that client and to make it a whole lot easier for them. And it's often to take out all those steps and I will be that person that will make the appointment, remind them about the appointment, get the script, get it in a Webster pack, take it to their pharmacist, um, take it to their house, arrange to meet them at a community health centre. There's a thousand ways to skin a cat in my job. And it's just about finding the right way for that person. And it's just being, just simplifying access to treatment. And that's really the mainstay of my work. With hepatitis B, there's different um, things to discuss because um, often people are from non-English speaking backgrounds, which makes things so, so difficult. People are working very hard. It's very hard to get a time off to do blood tests and appointments and ultrasounds and reviews with interpreters. And a big part of our job at the Liver Clinic at Bio and Health is trying to keep those people um, continuing um, access to their care. So it's a really interesting job. I'm incredibly lucky to have it and I absolutely love it. And it's varied all the time. So I do cover, I work at the Wuthering Aboriginal Health Service one Wednesday every month. And I work at Cryo Needles Range Exchange Program two days a week currently. And I work at the Outpatients Clinic. I work at Drug and Alcohol Services at um, Bow and Health, which is in the mall next to the reject shop. Um, and I also go into southwestern Victoria, as Amanda said, to Portland, Hamilton, Warrnambool, Lismore, Apollo Bay, Colac, Camperdown. I use community health centres to meet people. A lot of people can't travel far. Um, their anonymity is um, of, of importance to them as well. I'll often just say I'm just the uh, outpatient nurse seeing them for a liver fibre scan. Um, some people 
want to drive a little bit further away to access their care. And so we organise that. Um, so I'll really do anything I can to help them get treatment. I do a lot of, COVID has been brilliant in that it can um, open up telephone consults and that's been a, a bit of a game changer for people accessing care. And I do a lot of my communication via text. I can text like my teenagers um, and that has also been a great way to communicate to clients about compliance with their medication and um, remembering to pick up that next script and really just getting them through that eight to 12 weeks. So I, I'm, you know, got thumbs that work as fast as anyone that you know between the ages of 12 and 100. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't here to listen to Amanda's talk and I don't want to replicate what she said, but the goal is to eliminate um, hepatitis C by um, 2030. Will we do that? I think we will. One of the biggest things for me is about preventing reinfection. So we work in the harm minimization model in drug and alcohol services and across this country. Um, and it's very, very important that once someone has been treated for the hepatitis C, that you continue to screen them on an annual basis if they continue to be at risk. So when I work in the needle syringe exchange, I'll see some people, I'll give them up to 100 needles every couple of weeks. And they've had their treatment in 2016 when it came on the PBS. And I said, how about, you know, have you thought about getting tested again? And no, no, I've been tested. I'm all good. But I said, well, while you're getting 100 needles every time, there's still a little chance that they could come back. And these are my, you know, this is my mantra is that cleared your hep C, don't get it again. Um, it can pass through the filters, the tawnies, the spoons, the syringes, the barrel and the tip, so the needle and the actual syringe, the water and through your hands. And it just seems to happen a lot. And we do have people who are onto their third and fourth treatment um, now. The Medicare Benefit Scheme does provide an annual Point, uh, PCR test um, under the scheme. So it can always be done. There's no need to repeat an antibody again if someone has had hepatitis C in the past. And that's a thing that we get through lots of GPs in the emergency department in the hospital is repeated antibody tests. It tells us nothing about their current status. The PCR is key. A PCR does have to go into a dedicated tube, an SST gel tube. Um, it cannot be put into the lab with for any other test. And I think that's a really key thing is that it often gets missed in translation and in the lab, they'll run a normal hep C serology. So you get your antibody, which just tells us nothing new. It's very hard to, to, to explain that. COVID has really helped us with the understanding of what PCR means, that it means current infection. And I really use that to my advantage. We talk about rat tests and what that means. Um, so, Ongoing testing and ongoing screening is paramount. And I have so many people on my books. Once we're sorted, I say, how about we um, touch base in a year's time and do another test? And they're very, very happy to do that. Um, they like to know that they're continually clear. And I never miss an opportunity for harm reduction chats. I never miss um, an opportunity for general lifestyle, diet, exercise, um, and general health, and we will cover all those things. We often even talk about in people who are on using heroin, about going on to long-acting intramuscular buprenorphine. So often when you're doing a hep C chat and they see you as a trusted um, healthcare professional, it is just that one little opportunity that you can often sow the seeds for quite a few things at the time. And sometimes we'll just, while I'm doing a fibre scan, we'll just have a chat in general. Um, you know, if they want a blood pressure check or do the blood pressure, if they want a STI screen, I'll often talk to a man and we'll just add that onto the form. Um, there's a little bit of opportunity to do lots of things. I also do these things called the fibro scan, which is a liver fibrosis assessment. Amanda was talking before, it's a fairly important part of um, surveillance for people with hepatitis B, um, chronic hepatitis B, where you're looking at their progression towards cirrhosis and trying to prevent that through treatment. Um, and we also use it in hepatitis C where we use a fibre scan to assist us in a very simple way um, to determine someone's fibrosis assessment and whether they're on their way to cirrhosis, which 
has implications for how they're followed up after their treatment. If someone is cirrhotic at the time of commencing hepatitis C treatment, they are then on, under surveillance for the rest of their life. Every six months, ultrasound, AFP, LFT, um, and full blood counts for life. So it's an important thing to do at the start. And I think that's also something that probably throws GPs out a little bit as well is um, it's just another step. It's another thing to organise. I'm the only person with the fibre scan machine. And it's a little tiny thing and I have it in my car and drive it around everywhere. But it is something that takes organisation as well. Extremely useful tool. It really, I guess the other alternative, Amanda, would have been a liver biopsy to assist with some of this um, um, progression towards cirrhosis. So in terms of referring to the liver clinic, I'm a huge fan of health pathways from our primary health network. We have a very good primary health network. They're very comprehensive and constantly updating their health pathways. Um, you can follow the um, algorithm right through from hep C to hep B and to liver masses. And I just want to touch on that in a little bit for my um, colleague, Sue, who can't be with us today. She's on holiday because she turns 60. And the other way that you can get your treatment for hepatitis C is through a remote consultation. So what's happening now, since we had so much, so many people treated, 80 to 100,000 people treated in 2016 to sort of 2019, I suppose, um, it's kind of fallen off the knowledge base. And as a GP, you have to have you have to be across so many things. And then maybe once or twice a year, you get that person in with a hep C PCR. And it's really hard to remember all the things that you have to do. So under the um, health pathways is this really great form where you fill it in. You just send it to, to myself. I give it to Amanda. She fills it back in and tells you exactly what to prescribe going backwards to the um, practitioner. And it's a really fail safe way to make sure that your treatment is, um, that you know what you're doing. Because when you're not doing something all the time, it's incredibly hard to, to remember. So all of those re referral forms are there. Um, I guess a lot of my job is also just taking lots and lots of phone calls about, oh, where's that form? Or where's how do I get a fiber scan? Where's a GP? What blood test shall I order for hep B? What does it mean if the hep B core antibody is positive, but not the surface antigen? Does that mean they have to go under surveillance? And I will just do a lot of just general chit chat on the phone to um, GPs just to clarify some of those things while they're with the client. Um, and of course, I assist people in getting a referral to the liver clinic. And of course, because I work there, I'm able to fast track people when I see that there's an opportunity that um, should be seized in order to see someone sooner rather than later at our tertiary service. Um, and we have an amazing team of infectious diseases, physicians and gastroenterologists. It's an incredibly thorough service and we're very lucky to have it. And we do see people right through to basically the South Australian border um, by telephone. Um, so the future of eradication of hep C really lies in populations that are incredibly hard to access now. And I have just about to, on Tuesday, Amanda and I will be finishing a study at cryonedal syringe exchange called Quick Start, where people come in, they can do a finger prick for an antibody, a blood test and commence treatment for hep C all in the same 20 to 30 minutes. Um, it removes all those nine steps that I discussed before and, you know, has a lot of, um, it's an exciting way of moving treatment forward, particularly in regional remote areas, third world populations. Um, and point of care testing is something that we hope to be doing also down the track as well. So for all those people who know they're antibody positive, um, you just want to know that they're PCR positive or negative, and we'll be able to do that on a point of care test eventually. They'll become more and more um, common. Um, so I am really just kind of out there in the community and I can be reached on a phone number that I do have a referral form, but often I'll just do the phone call first and just take the patient's details and get back to people. It's a fairly informal way of referring to somebody. Um, so that is a form that a lot of people in mental health do use that suits them a lot better. And I can send that to you. I didn't put it up here. I just wanted to quickly touch on the liver mass clinic that we run seeing where 
I know liver well is hepatitis, viral hepatitis, but you know the whole reason we want to treat viral hepatitis is to prevent the progression to liver cirrhosis, uh, decompensated liver disease, and liver cancer. So often you will find, if you look, you'll often find masses, um, a liver mass that we have. We have a liver mass clinic and a chronic liver disease clinic. Have you done this, Amanda? Um, at the outpatients annex as well. So remember that a liver mass can be benign or malignant, and it often takes a little bit of nutting out to work out exactly what that is. Um, when people referred to, Sue just has asked me to say that a liver mass, as you know, is either a benign or malignant mass. Um, referrals for determining this and ongoing management is that the referral comes through to the gastroenterology unit at Geelong Hospital. Um, and it goes to the liver mass unit and they have a multidisciplinary team meeting every second Thursday with interventional radiologists, surgeons, um, gastroenterologists, and they interrogate the films to work out what exactly that mass is and if it's a liver cancer, what the treatments will be. And now at Geelong Hospital, um, we have a lot of liver cancer treatments that are done at the hospital whereas in the past people always had to travel to the Austin hospital we can they do consult a lot with the Austin as well for um some things as well so it's a really comprehensive service that is wildly popular um people can have all sorts of things in their liver big fatty lumps and they can have hemangiomas and they can have um primary liver cancers in tricky spots and it's a whole nother ball game but often very successful when um, identified early, which is why we do the six monthly um, hep hepatoma screening for those people who are at higher risk because of their liver um, fibrosis and cirrhosis and their past history of viral hepatitis. That was all from Sue Street. I've got some um, liver cancer brochures there from her and also the referral pathway and her, her card there if any, anybody wants those. Um, this is my number and my email, and I'm always really happy to chat. I love a chat. Call me anytime. <laughs> and thank you for having me today. I think I've said everything. Any, any questions? I have. For Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, Jude. Hi. So when I was on that um, really monitoring and doing the um the things that were the test is blood test is free. Yep. But what happens if they oh sorry. <laughs> Um, just about the regular monitoring, is that all covered by a GP or would that be a barrier to um, that follow-up if they have to pay for the ultrasound? Or... Sure, that, that, that's a really good question. So to, to again split it into the two sections with hepatitis C, if they're going to, if they continue to be at risk for hepatitis C, you can, any GP can just do the PCR test. That's, anyone can do that yes. as long as it's annually. If someone is got very deranged liver functions and they think that they've been at risk earlier you would do a pcr earlier um and i don't think medicare really check up on that oh, okay. so that, yeah, that so. too much to be honest if someone's at risk you wouldn't wait the 12 months uh waiting for that time to tick over to see if they have a reinfection of hep c and amanda <laughs> Amanda might just clarify that about the Medicare benefits scheme. Yeah, sorry, you just risk the patient getting a bill, that's all. Yeah. But at Liver Clinic, we pay. Yeah. I know. Just have to check with the lab. So it's not the, it's, it's the lab. The frequency of testing is, a, it's not a point of contention, but it's something that comes up all the time. I, it's not uncommon for me to get a client onto treatment and they've had five, Hep C PCRs done by every GP they've seen in the last 12 months. They're just tested over and over and over and they never seem to get a bill. It's a little bit of a grey area. And even in our, yeah, and even in our quick start study at the moment, people would have had, can have had a Hep C PCR done in the last 12 months at some stage. And we still do another one and no, never had a bill. I've never ever had anyone come back to say Hep B is different. 
the hep B DNA. So I just don't know if they've how it really works but you do try to keep it annually so going on to hepatitis b and ongoing well going back to hepatitis c and people who then achieve cure for hep c and then go into ongoing hepatoma surveillance if it's done through a public hospital of course all the blood tests and the ultrasounds are done um covered by the public health so system Um, so there's lots of, you know, we're, we're sort of sitting in the, in the middle of this half privatised, half public health system. And that's another job that we do is sort of negotiate and advocate for people that way. For my clients in Western Victoria, we, uh, they, they're kept within the outreach service in order to assist with that um, no cost ongoing surveillance. With hepatitis B, because they need specialist care, and there's very few um, HEP-B um, S100 providers, they will always come with us. Therefore, we are always following them up under the public health system as well. There are lots of places where you can negotiate a bulk build. Um, I have negotiated. Amanda helped me negotiate um, bulk build uh, ultrasounds for people across southwestern Victoria, which has been a huge help. Otherwise, they're, they're several hundred dollars out of pocket. We're lucky... We're lucky pathology is still covered mainly by Medicare. It's it's an individual case about how you will negotiate that. Definitely it's a huge barrier and time is a barrier. So people who might work in an abattoir, for example, will work six, often work six days a week and to get to an ultrasound is so hard and to get a, a, a break to do a phone consult with the interpreter that isn't in their break time is, is really hard. As you know, as a refugee health nurse as well, it's really difficult. Any other questions? Hi, Inga, it's Annette. Hello. Hi, Annette, nice <laughs> to meet you. You too, you too. Um, just a quick question, because that, that looks great. You've got those um, guidelines there for GPs or, mm. uh, you know, the process of to follow for treatment, testing and treatment. Is there something similar for consumers or clients because I find a lot of people that I work with sometimes don't know if they've you know how they've been treated or where they've got retested like yeah. more than years ago and so they're sort of lost and overwhelmed with the whole process as well but is there some documents available somewhere that's really easy to find for clients or consumers to know what the process is and that they can document their own you know the um, market is completely flooded with resources um, and and ways to get your Hep C treatment, but is there a really simple clear cut? Yeah, well there must be. I just don't know if it exists. What do you think, Amanda? I was just going to say that this this particular this is... tool was built um, in response to the way the hepatitis C drugs were listed on the PBS, and they were listed in a really bizarre way, in that they said that any uh, medical or nurse practitioner in the country can write a script for direct acting antiviral drugs. Um, if you're experienced in the management of hepatitis C, just go ahead and write it. If you're inexperienced in the management, do it in consultation with a specialist, but in consultation was really loosely defined. So that could be, it was taken out as it could be a phone call, it could be um, you know, it could be a, an email, it could be a letter, it could be a whatever. So we were like, right, we'll just work something out about that. So this was our answer to that. So this was a specific tool for GPs to be able to assist them to prescribe and fulfil the PBS criteria for that in-consultation thing. So this, this wasn't built... It was for consumers in that it was empowering their GP to prescribe, but it wasn't for consumers in any other way. Um, often when we see people, they ask for their results to be printed out. <laughs> but you're quite right, because then, you know, um, other healthcare workers get confused, like the number of people mm. that hepatitis C antibodies are ordered. It's like, oh, my God, once it's positive, just don't ever order it again. Mm. It's not going to help anyone. Mm. Or people get told they're positive again. 
when they've got an antibody positive again, it's like, uh, and they know they're not, mm. we, you know, so I don't, I don't know, but maybe, maybe Liverwell might know much better the resources out there, but we don't have a good one Yeah, that says to someone, you know. It's, it's, it's like when you ask someone their vaccination history. So I've worked as a GP nurse and you say, oh, you know, have you had your travel vaccines? Um, no. And then you go into their file and they're comprehensively covered. And it's just, you know, about remembering your own health results. People with hep C are usually very clear that they've had treatment with either interferon injections or the tablets. They usually have some recollection of that happening. And they often will say to me, oh, no, I'm, I'm clear. I'm done. I've had the treatment and I had the blood test after and I'm cured. And it's just about teasing that out. One thing a lot of people say to me is they, um, I said, have you had treatment for hep C before? Oh, yeah, like I cured myself. And that's you've got to work out what that means for them as well. So they've actually eradicated the virus through their own immune system and have cleared the P their PCR negative, but the hep C antibody positive and they... Um, 25% of people do that, but they often say that they've had treatment and that sort of treatment is their own body. So you do have to sort of tease it out a little bit. Uh, I of always offer to print a result for them. People often don't like to carry that around in case it just goes AWOL. You know, the stigma with hep C is so enormous. It directly, you know, 80% of people with hepatitis C do have a history of injecting drug use. It does always tend to point directly to that. I'm always really careful to... Uh, point out that it's from blood transfusion before 1990, before tattoos, body piercings done in an unsterile environment, uh, medical procedures done in an unsterile environment. Sometimes I'll put, I usually put the injecting drug sharing equipment at the very bottom of my list of how you can get hep C. That's usually with my mother's friends that I'll talk about all the different ways. So you're constantly trying to reduce stigma every day. Um, yeah. And explaining people to people about their antibodies, what that means, it's little little kind of um, biology 101s a lot. People do get it. Sure. The Liverwell app might be helpful for people. They can upload their results onto the app. There have been a few um, more recent uh, improvements made so there should be a little well app card in your pack um, so it probably means that people need to request or upload the results themselves it says add your own test results then you can track and graph them to compare upload your scans and photos to radiology results now I'm not quite sure how that happens practical how to yeah so that might be right okay yeah so that might be helpful for people who choose to do that yeah the difficulty of adherence to um, medication schedules and appointment appointments there's reminders in the mm. app and it's a free app so I was going to ask you Inga whether you think that's useful for people who do have a phone do they yeah. use tools like that there, there's definitely they do I mean there's varying degrees of of um people's usage with their phone a lot of my clients lose their phone on a regular mm. basis yeah and a lot of people do change their phone number mm. for various reasons yeah. but for people who um you know, are really tech savvy with their phones. I think it's a great app. I've downloaded that onto my phone and I do show people. Um, and I always try to round it up with what their actual status is and then what they need to tell their health practitioner in the future, wherever they bounce into, whether it's ED or a GP. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm all for, for the app, that's for sure. Mm, it's just about privacy, I guess, and having that information around. Yeah. Just just quickly, while Annette's here from um, Nimai uh, and Bolton Clark, I work. I I don't double up. I will use someone like Annette to do all the groundwork with getting a client. I'll send her, email her the blood forms, um, 
send her all the reminders for appointments and they do all the work. Sometimes I won't even see a client because the mental health clinician, the homeless outreach worker, um, their social worker, uh, the myriad of people involved in people's care can do all of that. I don't have to double up and I don't have to re-text that client because they don't need me texting them on top of Annette and all their other people. So it's to keep it super simple and use the people that are out there. And there's, I, I work with hundreds of different clinicians and they are and and peer workers and they are absolute key to getting this job done because they're seeing the client every day um so that's just really important and i i get lots of referrals from the Geelong withdrawal unit from windana from uh lazarus from uh varying uh parts of the selvos if, if they're relocating and also community corrections where people are coming out of prison on a community corrections order who are half treated um, or have um, had blood tests done in prison but come out of prison a little bit early. So there's so many different ways to do this job. Thanks.